All right, welcome back to Computer Science E1. This is lecture 12, exciting conclusion. So it's a big day for me. I've been saying for six months that I'm going to switch from PCs to Macs, and here we have the Mac. So I will ineptly stumble my way through any demonstrations while Dan outperforms me on the same laptop over there. Uh, but I figure, uh, much like you all might struggle sometimes with new hardware, new software, now you can see me do it perhaps as well. So I had a little training before class began today. So today's really just about wrapping up the course and giving you a taste, hopefully, of where you started this course and hopefully where you are now, looking back on some topics briefly that you may once have found uh, fairly unfamiliar, but perhaps now you're a little more comfortable talking about some of the stuff. And along the way, we've got a few demonstrations that we can have a bit of fun with. So we began this this course, recall, way back in lecture one when we talked about hardware and our discussion of hardware focused on the lowest level details, bits and bytes and ASCII, CPUs, motherboards and so forth. And maybe just to get things warmed up here, let me ask, uh, let's start with a medium difficulty question. How do you represent the number seven in binary? Ooh, good. I thought we'd have some awkward silence there. So one, 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 right? The, the fours column, the twos column, and the ones column. So there you have the number seven. All right, let's come up with a slightly harder question. What is the decimal equivalent of the ASCII letter capital A? Wow, 65. Look, oh, yeah, 65 is indeed correct. How about lowercase a? Oh, 97. Wow, we should really have had prizes for this. All right, uh, let's try an, what I thought would be an easy question. Uh, what is, say, a typical amount of level, well, actually, this is medium, typical amount of level 2 cache that you might have in a computer these days? 8 megabytes. That feels a little high, actually. Can yeah. I reject that? Yeah. Yeah, that's too high. OK, <laughs> nice try, though. <coughs> Something more reasonable? Yeah. Two, uh, I don't hear very committal answers, but yeah, so like a megabyte, two megabytes, and L2 cache. All right, so let's flip things around. Ask Dan a question about hardware. Why me? <laughs> More awkward this way. Okay, so I guess moving on <laughs> to uh, lecture two a little bit, we talked a oh. bit more about um, hardware, and we went into some more detail about some of the specific components in the computer, whereas level one was very low level. We showed you a lot of the, um, uh, the bits and bytes and, and how to convert between binary and decimal. Uh, level two, or uh, lecture two, was really about uh, talking about specific things, such as how hard drives work and how what virtual memory is and uh, how the relationship between the CPU, the RAM, and the hard drive all sort of uh, works together in order to produce the images and the text that you see on the screen. And so just as a refresher, what is virtual memory? Virtual memory, yes. Right, very good. So it's when part of the hard drive space is used for RAM. So this can happen frequently if you have run out of RAM, where, uh, which is used for your currently running programs, and the operating system will open up some space or will use some of the open space on your hard drive in order to place some of these running programs. And of course, what's the downside to having virtual memory, though? So while it virtually extends your memory, what's the downside to it? Yes. That's right, it's a lot slower. So uh, if you remember this diagram that we had where uh, we were showing as the capacity of certain elements grew, so for example, the hard drive is the largest capacity memory in your computer, the RAM is lower capacity and, and onto the L2 cache, L1 cache, and finally the registers. Uh, as these storage units become larger, they're actually also slower as well. So that means that these things that are closer to the CPU, the registers are very, very fast, they just don't have a lot of memory uh, to store a lot of data, where uh, these, these cheaper devices, hard drives and RAM, come into play in order to store a lot of these things. And we also talked a bit about uh, other peripherals, such as CD players, DVD drives. We didn't talk a lot about some of the newer optical drives, like Blu-ray and the now defunct uh, HD DVD drives that, that were popular just a, a couple years ago, but were beaten out by Blu-ray. But uh, these are all examples of peripherals that are used for external storage. So whereas the hard drive is used for uh, storing your programs while your computer is off, 
these same peripherals can do the same thing, except obviously store data that you want to bring onto your computer. Um, let's see, we also talked a lot about some of the internal devices that you can plug in, a lot of the plugs or connectors that are available on the motherboard. And what are some of those? Do you remember? For example, what kind of plugs exist for us to connect a hard drive to the motherboard of a machine? There were a couple of ports or connectors inside the, the motherboard. Anyone remember some of these connections? Yes. MIDI? So MIDI is a, is a file format for audio. Um, and yeah, we did go through a lot of um, <laughs> acronyms. So I understand one of them. Yes. DVI. DVI, that's, um, that is an external port for um, uh, monitor connections or digital, it's basically a digital video interface. So for example, some projectors will have it more, digital monitors will have a DVI connector. But internally, you'll most likely see IDE or uh, SATA or SATA connectors to connect your hard drive. Of course, if you have an external hard drive, what are some of the common, or what is the most common port you might use if you have an external hard drive. Yeah, USB, which of course is the general port. You can plug in just about everything, minus your kitchen sink perhaps, into it. So you got all those components, and you might know how they all interconnect. But these days, you typically buy them all together. So we've ended lecture two and transitioned to lecture three by talking about how to buy a computer. So you go into a typical store, say Micro Center, and what's the first thing you should do when you want to buy a computer in that case? Hopefully turn around and walk out, right? So don't go to stores like Micro Center because you'll probably pay way more than you have to, right? All right? So in fairness, you can get deals at stores these days. Even Best Buy sells, I think, Dell computers these days. But beware going into stores. I mean, in fact, case in point, I went into Staples in Harvard Square just the other day because very suddenly I needed to get an external USB, actually, hard drive. And they make these wonderfully small USB hard drives these days that actually have inside of them those drives that are known as two and a half inches. So this is a two and a half inch hard drive. And take a guess how many gigs are on this hard drive. And this is just a USB cable. What's that? Yeah, so this was 500. And unfortunately, at Staples, I paid $189. Then I went home later that day, uh, hopped on Google. Guess how much I found it for at Amazon? Uh, not as good, but 129 so like $60 cheaper. And this is just, I mean, the reality. If you had to, if your instinct is to head to these local brick and mortar stores, odds are you will end up paying more. But whether you're shopping in a store or shopping online, what are some of the questions that, or what are some of the specs that are perhaps relevant to you, the consumer? So what kinds of numbers, what kinds of hardware do you actually have some discretion over when choosing a computer? Yeah, so RAM. So what's a typical amount of RAM that you might want these days in a new computer, be it a laptop or desktop? Yeah. Three, uh, three megabytes or more. Okay. Uh, three, gig or three gigabytes? More. Yeah, so I mean definitely one, two, and even three these days. Vista, I think, sort of hopes that you have two, three gigabytes. And you can have even way more than that in higher end desktops. So somewhere in the gigabytes, the low gigabytes range for RAM is sort of where you want to be at mentally. Uh, what else do you have choice over when buying a computer? Yeah, so size of the hard drive. So clearly a valid answer to that question is something in the 500 gig range. But what else is perhaps a common value that you might want to have inside your own? And again, there's no right, one right answer here. OK, so like 160 gigs, especially if it's a laptop, because they tend to be somewhat smaller. 320, uh, maybe 750. You can buy terabyte drives. So a terabyte is 1,000 gigabytes. So that's like, but you know, that sounds like a lot, but that's just two of those tiny little things these days. So very quickly do things change. What other values do you have discretion over or some consumer choice? Yeah, so RPMs of the hard drive, right, in a desktop, common values were 7,200 and uh, 10,000 in high-end PCs or 5,400. You don't have as much discretion there. But if you're really being a geek, for instance, and you're worried about the amount of heat in your computer, or in my case years ago when I was upgrading my TiVo manually by opening it up, and it's just a computer running Linux, I re realized having read online a bit that 
it wasn't really designed to have multiple hard drives inside. And so a lot of the geeks online would suggest that you really get a slower hard drive so that it generates less heat if you're putting twice as many drives in there, even though there's the same number of fans. So sure, that's certainly a metric. What else? What's sort of the brains of the computer that you really have influence over? Yeah, so what's a typical CPU value these days? <laughs> that's very specific. OK, so 2.67. Uh, ooh. Gigahertz, right? So for CPUs, it's also in the giga range these days. So 1 gigahertz, 1 1.2, 2 gigahertz, and then for even higher end PCs, you can get almost into the, you know, the threes or so range. But you kind of see a, a glass ceiling of sorts, at least if you're paying for um, some of the top of the line PCs these days. You don't have like a 10 gigahertz computer, but rather what do you have the more and more you pay and the higher end you go these days? Yeah, so you have multiple cores, which is kind of like, and we don't go into great detail here, but it's kind of like having multiple CPUs, each of which is maybe 1 gigahertz or 2 gigahertz. So you might have a total of like 10 gigahertz of power, but that it only means that, say, one program, say Microsoft Word, can use 2 gigahertz of power, whereas another program running, quote unquote, simultaneously can use the other CPU. So it's not necessarily an aggregate. So remember that uh, while we were talking about gigahertz and cores uh, in these lectures, we also mentioned something to be wary of, and that is uh, in, in multiple computers, you can compare how, the amount of RAM that each has. So for example, you have two computers side by side. One has two gigabytes of RAM. The other has three gigabytes of RAM. And you know that the one with three gigabytes of RAM will be able to run more programs without needing to access its virtual memory as frequently. However, when you were talking about uh, the speed of a CPU, it's difficult to compare the speed of, of different models of CPUs. So for, exam for example, Intel CPUs to AMD CPUs, even though they would have different uh, gigahertz ratings, the one that is lower might indeed be faster. So nowadays, uh, what we see is uh, marketing speak coming from these companies trying to say, you know, append more and more uh, adjectives to their, uh, their course. For example, what is Intel up to? Intel Quad Core Extreme 2, something like that, which becomes ridiculous. But uh, frequently, if you want to find the fastest CPU out there, you usually have to look around, especially on the internet, for people who actually test these CPUs to find out which one is faster. Because just because there is one that has a higher gigahertz rating doesn't necessarily mean that it is any better. However, that being said, generally within the same model range, so for example, within these Intel CPUs, uh, if you do have one that's higher gigahertz, then most likely it will be faster than the lower gigahertz one. So not meant to confuse, of course, it's just that there are some terms or there are some values when you are buying a computer that, that can affect the performance more than others. So for example, like I said, uh, when you're comparing RAM, you really can compare between two machines, but when you're comparing the CPU, you have to be a little bit more careful. And realize, too, when you exit this course that we've thrown a lot of technical jargon and specifications at you. But when it comes to normal computing and a typical person in this room buying a computer, realize that you don't necessarily have to understand all the nuances between the various models of CPUs and such. And if I can be so bold as to just offer subjective advice, I would say if you're going out to buy a new computer tomorrow or, say, within the next six months, Minimally, it should be a dual core computer of some sort because just having two CPUs or the, effective, the effect of two CPUs in your computer is generally a good thing because that means literally two things can be happening simultaneously. And given how many of us do multiple things at once, run multiple programs at once, that's typically, in fact, a good thing. And in terms of speed these days, at least one gigahertz and probably closer to 1.5 or 2. But it's really only the true geeks in this class or sort of in general that really might care about a lot of these specifics. So so if you are really into graphic design and Photoshop, so if you really liked our focus on multimedia several weeks ago and you really want to get into Photoshop and play with some high-end filters, certainly video or audio, well, it's people like that that actually do need to spend a bit more money and maybe do a bit more research as to which computer can really be up to the task of what's high-end graphics processing. Similarly, if you're a real gamer and you like to play really nice interactive 3D games, well, you're probably going to give some more thought and some more money to getting a really good CPU or really good graphics card. But for most of us, frankly myself included, who spends 90% of his time using the web and using email, you know, most any computer out there is a, is a pretty good bet these days. And so really price is perhaps the biggest factor, I would say. 
In fact, if you're going to go out and buy a new computer, so I personally am sort of anti brick and mortar and certainly uh, micro center given their, their pricing. I mean, where, what sites have we proposed? What sites have you used to go out and find deals? In other words, where should you begin? Yeah. CNET. Uh, sorry? CNET. So CNET has wonderful reviews, especially about specific pieces of hardware. When I was buying a printer fairly recently, I did some Googling. Uh, I think it was a Canon laser printer of some sort, the model number I forget, but. CNET popped up with some really good reviews. What other sites? So Dell.com. Um, you know, love them or hate them, they actually do have very aggressive pricing and pretty good support contracts. So even for home computers, if you're comfortable with buying a computer online or from the Sunday brochure as opposed to from a store, um, certainly get some pretty good deals from them. And how about some of those sites we've recommended, um, even myself in particular, and sort of pushed you toward deals-oriented sites? What's a URL or two? Yeah, so Newegg.com is a very good site um, in terms of pricing that a lot of people shop at. Personally, I would only caution about Newegg that they are annoying when it comes to returns. They, very, they try to stick you with restocking fees, whereas someone like Amazon is wonderfully generous when it comes to doing things like returns. So do beware with some of the fine print, but they're very popular. What else? Tiger okay, Tiger Direct is popular too. What about sites, though, that aggregate deals on the internet? I think we offered up at least one or two URLs. Yeah, so personally, I love Deal News. You go to dealnews.com, they've got categories on the right hand side, and whether you're looking for a hard drive or a computer or even a TV, they very nicely have everything categorized. And they're not particularly biased, they just say, here are some current deals from the week. You go ahead and buy it from any of these stores that you might be interested in. Dealram.com is a related site where if you're buying RAM for your computer, it's wonderful in that you tell them assuming you have a popular computer, the make and model, and they'll tell you exactly what kind of RAM you can get as well. Yeah, David made some fairly good points just a few moments ago when he mentioned that uh, what we've been talking about, having high amounts of RAM, having very fast CPU, uh, though it is important when you start working on specific tasks or tasks that are very intensive or CPU intensive or graphics intensive, uh, most modern computers, really even the, the very cheap ones, are very good at just checking email or browsing the web. So uh, what uh, many people seem to be doing lately is having uh, one machine or so that uh, is very, very powerful that can do the tasks that, that it needs to do very well. So for example, if you become uh, a gamer or a, a Photoshop junkie, then what you might do is buy a, a higher end machine with lots and lots of RAM or a high graphics card, depending on the need. Then you might have just some smaller machines that are just not as expensive and, and maybe uh, at the most, bump up the RAM a little bit so that you can have a lot of web browsers open, for example, and have your email and various other programs. And those are usually good enough to just get uh, web browsing and, and these sort of common tasks out of the way. Uh, even computers now are, uh, obviously, they, they're shrinking. And, uh, uh, and we've seen now some of this uh, trend lately towards these, uh, this class of computers called netbooks, which are very, very small laptops. They're, uh, of course, uh, underpowered compared to desktops or even their much larger laptops, but just doing what they are intended to do, checking email and going onto the web, they're very well designed for that because there is enough speed to get it done. So while you could absolutely geek out and say, oh man, I really want that extra 0.2 gigahertz in a CPU, really doesn't seem to be that important these days to just be able to get work done or to just have a little bit of fun, which might involve email or or web surfing. And if I can hop up on the soapbox here before we move on to software, like honestly, if you take nothing else away from the earliest lectures in this course with all of the acronyms and all, with all the technical minutia, like if you don't understand some term that you see in some print or on some advertisement, just Google it, right? So one of the takeaways, hopefully, of this course has been to give you a sense that it doesn't matter so much if you know every little detail about these things, but you know where to find the information. You know where to find better prices. You know it to turn to sites like Wikipedia or Webopedia or any of the sites that we've sort of promoted during the semester, and it's all freely available information. I, it's, it's people like Dan, to be honest, that I turn to when you know, I don't have a clue as to how to get my Mac to start projecting on the screen, or I don't know some low-level detail about my digital camera. And so hopefully you'll get from this course uh, in exiting it um, perhaps a little more confidence that uh, if you don't really know something, that's fine. You at least know how to go figure it out. Um, we spent our third lecture in the course on 
a video instead of an actual discussion of software. But what we thought we would do here to sort of break the ice or loosen things up is give you some examples of some prototypical uh, software related errors, the sorts of things that cause people to scratch their head or even uh, swear at their computer. It's unfortunately a little blurry, but that's just as well, since most of us probably don't even know what this thing for years has been trying to say to us. But this is the so-called what? BSOD, or blue screen of death. And random E1 anecdote, one year a lecture fell on Halloween, and Halloween happened to be exam one's date. And just to be fun, we decided to say, if you show up in costume to your exam, we'll give you an extra point on your actual exam. So a gentleman very creatively showed up as the blue screen of death. And he walked into the lecture hall literally with a, a box on his head. I think it had a couple of eye holes, but it had this blue screen on the facade. So you know you're in a, C a computer science class when you show up wearing a blue screen of death. Uh, we have next for you this particular example. Come on, this example here. Oh, see, here's that ineptitude I promised. Ah, true error message, right? What do you do when you actually get something like this? So not only is this indicating some kind of error, it's also revealing an error on whose part? Right, the, the programmer, the person who actually wrote the code in C or C++ or whatever that was supposed to clearly have some kind of error message or informative message there, but it was not to be. How about this one? and read the text. <laughs> right, so that's just, you kind of scratch your head when you encounter something like this. Another fun one is, this is classic, actually. <laughs> right, this is infuriating if you're trying to get past this point at your computer. Not uncommon, right? If uh, you, You'll see in computers' BIOS screens, PCs' BIOSes, where you get just the black background and the white text there, too, if there's no keyboard found. There's absolutely been instances where the BIOS has told the user, you know, press F... Keyboard not found. Press F1 to continue. Like this, though, was from uh, what? Uh, this was from Windows uh, 95. Uh, how about this one? All right. So this is when your blue screen of death really becomes public. So this is some kind of billboard in some uh, some city, and uh, clearly that billboard was being driven by Windows. And you see this thing pretty often. In fact, another instance, I think it's up next, where Windows was clearly being used was in this case. You can recognize some airports' arrivals and departures. So Windows is used in many different contexts. Even if it doesn't look like Windows, that doesn't mean it's not if the program simply happens to be full screened, as apparently is the case here. Another example is uh, this joke, right? Back in the day when you were constantly hitting Control-Alt-Delete, why not have a dedicated little keypad for such? And let's see if we have a, another little one here. No, not yet. So, ooh, spoiled that part. OK. <laughs> Back to Dan. OK, um, so after software, which really was uh, a fun look into um, some of the history behind Apple and Microsoft, we started talking about the interweb or the internet. And uh, we really started to pick it apart and, and go into some of the, the nitty gritty details about how it works and packets, how, uh, how a packet being sent from your computer can be routed to another person's computer. And uh, we introduced this idea of an IP address where it's basically just an address for your computer that allows other computers on the internet to be able to communicate with it, very much like uh, your mailing address at home, where you're able to receive and send mail uh, via that mailing address. And we talked about some, um, some of the specific uh, protocols, I think. Oh, no, that was the next lecture. So we did talk about email and some of these protocols associated with it. Who remembers some of these protocols that are associated with email? There are three more acronyms here that, yes? SMTP. SMTP, OK, that's very good. That's for outgoing email. Yep. IMAP, IMAP that's another one that's incoming mail. And I'm sorry? Pop. Yep, POP. So there, there are two different kinds of protocols for incoming mail, IMAP and POP. And uh, each one has its uh, advantages and disadvantages, though uh, uh, nowadays, if you have multiple computers or you're on the road a lot, it's generally recommended that you use IMAP protocol if you're going to be checking your email, uh, unless you're using some sort of webmail uh, email function like uh, Google or Hotmail, for example, where it really doesn't matter. You're not really using either of those protocols. What protocol would you be using in that case if you were trying to access your Gmail or your Hotmail? How do you access? So that email. 
Yes. That's right, HTTP. So you go to it via a web page, and you're using then, by using a web browser, you're using the HTTP protocol, which of course, remember, we talked about this notion beyond IP addresses and protocols, but ports that are associated with specific things on, uh, or specific protocols on the internet. So for example, HTTP protocol always operates, or almost always operates, out of port 80. There's a couple of other uh, famous ports out there, but pretty much every uh, software that you use communicates or that, that communicates with the internet does so through a port. And um, beyond that, we talked about the secure version of those. So there's HTTP and then there's its secure version, which is, right, HTTPS, which is mostly used, of course, with uh, credit card transactions, banking, that sort of thing, where your data must be encrypted in some way. But the downside to HTTPS would be what? Yeah. That's right, it's slower because it does have to be encrypted not only by your computer, but it has to be decrypted on the server side. So it takes not only your computer just a little bit of extra time to communicate over HTTPS, but also it takes the server just a little bit more time to do it. So this is frequently why uh, many times when you log into a site such as Facebook and Amazon.com, when you're actually typing in your user details, I think Gmail might do this as well, you type in your user details, it sends it over HTTPS, but then it forwards you over to an HTTP or a non-secure version of the site because once you're logged in, they assume that that data isn't really, doesn't really need to be encrypted. So it saves them some money in terms of having more cycles in their computer in order to uh, access more users or for more users to access them and it also frees up your computer a bit as well. So what are the implications of that? Once you have logged into Gmail or Facebook or MySpace or whatnot and you're sitting there in Starbucks sipping your coffee, what do you have to appreciate even if you accept this reality? Hmm? It's not secure, right? The lack of encryption means that that random person next to you at Starbucks could be running a program like the packet sniffer that I ran a few weeks ago where they too are seeing all these packets fly by on their screen. If they get a little curious or a little too curious, they can start diving into those packets and look at the most recent instant message you sent to someone or the most recent email that you've sent. Or if you are visiting a website that doesn't use SSL at all, they'll see your username and password. So what should the takeaway there be? What's your takeaway, perhaps? Yeah, so it's kind of up to you as to where the line is between you know, what's acceptable and what's just not acceptable. But yeah, don't do anything particularly sensitive, at least if it's not at all encrypted. And as I've preached before, I personally will never check like my Bank of America accounts on any computer other than my own, even if it's on HTTPS. Because if I sit down in some internet cafe or even some kiosk at Harvard, you know, I don't know what the person before me put on that computer. There might be some trivial little program that's doing what? Very easily. Yeah, logging every keystroke type and just uploading those keystrokes or emailing those keystrokes out to whoever that adversary was. So again, appreciate the threats and don't necessarily let it cripple you or keep you off the internet entirely, but at least know what some of those implications are. We spent more time in our follow-up lecture on the internet Talking about some of the wiring now and how you actually build networks. So in our first lecture on the internet, we focused on the applications, the services that the internet provides, mail and web and so forth. But then we dove down a little deeper, and my apologies that this projector only seems to be getting uh, more blurry here. Um, but we talked about interesting protocols like DHCP. DHCP, why is that useful, even if it's an odd sounding acronym? Yeah. Yeah, so it assigns your computer upon booting up or connecting to the internet or to the local network an IP address, and that's what you need, a unique IP address to actually be on the internet. But even that's a bit of a white lie. In what sense do you not necessarily need a unique IP address to be on the internet these days? Or, put another way, in what contexts are you actually sharing an IP address? Answer either question. I and mean, why? Why do they have these private IP addresses? And you send out just to computers on the network itself. They're not used on the internet. Exactly. The network itself has more than used to the network. Exactly. 
So most any of us here who have multiple computers at home or multiple people on those multiple computers or perhaps just a wireless computer at home probably have some kind of router, some kind of access point, some kind of home router. It can be called any number of things these days. And that thing's purpose in life is to either one, make your connection wireless, or two, share your connection among multiple com people, whether they're wired computers or wireless computers. And to do that, even though Comcast or Verizon are only giving you one IP address, they have to create the illusion internally that every computer does in fact have a unique IP address and so you get these these fake or these private IP addresses that almost always by convention are of the form 192.168.something dot something but as soon as your packets go out on the internet and through your home router out into the the cloud that is the internet they are exposed by way of the one IP address that Comcast or Verizon or whoever has actually assigned to you and then when it comes back into the router the reason that that router is actually a router it's not just a dumb switch or hub is that it actually remembers who sent some packets out was it 192.168.1.1 or was it dot two or was it dot three and it figures out to whom inside your home to send that that data back to so we discussed a variety of ways of connecting your computer to a network so David just mentioned for example wired and wireless and more specifically uh, there would be Ethernet using an Ethernet cable and Wi-Fi respectively but there is another way or there are other ways of connecting to the internet as well and though we didn't really talk about this um, uh, it seems useful to mention now and, and certainly what you what you see nowadays is that there are a variety of um, telecom companies such as Verizon or AT&T, T-Mobile that are offering devices such as these which have a USB port on one of them and they actually allow you to connect to the internet using these networks, uh, using the network that's, that's available to you from each of these carriers. And this isn't uh, Wi-Fi and this isn't obviously wired. It is a different technology altogether. It works basically upon the same principle as your cell phone. It, it, you can sit in a cafe that may not have uh, Wi-Fi or it may have some annoyingly, uh, some Wi-Fi that you annoyingly have to pay for and you can plug in uh, this device and usually they they have a whole variety of acronyms that are associated with them as well but you can you can plug in a device such as this into your computer and be able to access the internet that way and it just seems worthwhile to note that th though this technology does exist it is limited of course by the network so if you have uh, let's say a dead zone in your house you will have a you, know, you will be in a dead zone with that device in that same location as well. So it, it has the same sort of limitations as cell phones, uh, but it also has the same advantages. You can then use this sort of technology in a car while you're driving down the highway. Hopefully you're not the one driving, but someone else could be. Uh, and uh, I mean, there's just a whole variety of uses that, that this sort of technology is, is useful. Uh, there is this push for this new technology called WAN, I think, which is based upon the same idea of, of Wi-Fi and uh, just generally speaking it seems to be a merge of, of uh, Wi-Fi and these, uh, this wireless network or these uh, cellular telephone network capabilities but it would have to be deployed city-wide and so there just seems to be too much uh, infrastructure to overcome for that so most likely we'll just have to maintain these 3G devices as they're called and uh, Wi-Fi for now. Um, but one thing that you may or may not know is that if your phone has data capabilities, uh, for example, Blackberries or uh, some of these newer Android phones, for example, they by themselves can connect to the internet over your uh, cellular network's data connection, which is basically the same sort of technology as, as this device that I was just showing you. And some of these phones can even be used as an intermediary. So you can connect your computer to your phone and then your phone will connect to the internet uh, in the same in the same similar way. It's called tethering, and, and many phones that have data capability do have it. Uh, and it's it's actually pretty interesting. So if that's something you are interested in, you should certainly take a look to see if your phone supports data and if it supports tethering. But just be aware that you may have to, of course, pay for such a, such a convenience. So then we got on to some fun stuff, some multimedia. This is something we look at most every day. You pull up a web page and you see a whole bunch of multimedia formats. Among them, JPEG, JPEG. GIF. GIF, 
Eh, yeah, that's pretty much it. But yeah, TIFF is another one. We talked about EPS briefly, PDF. Uh, certainly in the video formats, there's a whole slew, flash formats and QuickTime and Windows Media. But at least in the context of graphics, where we spent some time dabbling, dabbling so much so that you yourselves ended up exhibiting atop our website these new designs, which <laughs> that's a cute one. So we added all of these uh, pseudo randomly to the course's website so that anytime you pull up the page, it tends to change. Or if you click the image explicitly, it will actually change. And remarkably so, we found a color scheme that doesn't look too bad with completely, well, that's a really nice one, random. Oh, that's cute. Uh, we love them all equally, actually, is, is what the, the point is. Um, <laughs> But they all came out very nice. But you probably had to make a choice between using GIF or JPEG, and what might motivate choosing one over the other? Everything will literally be clearer soon. <laughs> OK, so lossy versus lossless compression. So lossless, as the word implies, means that you don't actually lose any quality, but you nonetheless gain some compression. Lossy, by contrast, is a file format like what? JPEG. So the way JPEG actually saves some bits is by throwing away useful information. So you may have experienced in Photoshop, if tinkering with photographs in particular, that if you move that little slider from quality equals maximum at 12 or quality equals minimum at 1, you really do start to see what Dan showed a few weeks ago as the blotchiness. Things really, you know, much like this, things get a little less clear. Um, what else is, distinguishes GIF from JPEG? Yeah, so GIFs have the ability to have transparency. And this was useful if you're trying to overlay an image on top of something else, and you don't want to have that ugly rectangular background that underneath it all actually constitutes a graphic. Pings or PNGs also support transparency. Unfortunately, some browsers, like older versions of Internet Explorer, don't render transparency properly. So unfortunately, it's an imperfect world. Anything else that distinguishes GIF from JPEG? So the ability to animate. Uh, if we, <laughs> our favorite little dancing hamsters, which have yet to make an appearance today, um, were a whole bunch of animated GIFs, or little cartoons that were one GIF after the other, but all self-contained within a file. So besides these types of files, we talked about a different type. So all of these are forms of raster files, or raster images, where uh, in some form or another, each and every pixel is defined by the file. So what does this mean, for example, when we start zooming in very, very far to one of these files? Pixelation. Right, pixelation, exactly. And so there's another format that's used to battle this. Vectors. Yes, vectors. So though we have vector images, they're mostly used for things such as clip art or more cartoonish sort of images. If you remember, we had the, uh, the four horses that uh, would sing a cappella, and that was done in vector form so that we could make the, the browser window as large or as small as we wanted, and it would still remain sharp. And so though vectors are very cool in this, in, this, uh, in this way, they're just not as useful for photographs, for example, because it's just a lot easier, or it's, it just makes a lot more sense when talking about digital cameras, for example, or when scanning in something that we can represent a photo with individual dots or with individual pixels. So besides this, we talked about some other formats as well, such as audio. And we came up with a variety of them. Of course, the most popular uh, audio type nowadays is MP3. You hear that all over the place. But there's other ones as well, AAC, uh, MIDI, if you remember, which is a, a different type altogether. And what, what distinguishes a MIDI file from an MP3 or some other AAC format, for example? Yes. That's right. So basically, uh, all a MIDI file is, is it's just uh, uh, a collection. The, the computer records a collection of notes. And it says that, OK, this collection of notes must be played by this instrument. This note must have a duration of this long, for example. And so in this way, it's essentially, you can think of it essentially like putting music or sheet music into a file that the computer then reads and plays back for you. So obviously, you lose certain things, such as voice. It's, there's no way to record voice which a file, with a file such as this. Uh, and it can sound different on different computers, because one computer may play it a little bit differently than the other. So if you want uh, exact reproduction, you certainly would want something more popular, such as MP3. Uh, but if you just want to get your music out there or just share your music, you would certainly use something such as MIDI. And in fact, uh, if you are interested in, uh, or if you're 
if you are a musician yourself, you will probably find a lot of information on MIDI where you can play your instrument, whether it be piano, uh, sometimes guitar, drums, all, all sorts of different instruments. Uh, you can play them while this instrument is connected to your computer and your computer will record the notes and the duration and be able to basically create a MIDI file for you or uh, essentially create a score, just the musical score that can be used there. So besides this, we then sort of mashed all of this stuff together and talked about video. So there's many different types of video out there. There's QuickTime, there's uh, Windows Media and uh, Real Player. There's just all sorts of video out there. Some of it can be streamed and some of it cannot. So uh, streamed video you've probably seen on our website. Uh, Flash now uh, has video capabilities that can be streamed, a la YouTube, for example. QuickTime can be streamed, variety of other things. We even talked a bit about HD video. So what makes a video HD? High definition, the big, the big term now that everybody throws around. Yeah, so it's basically the size of the image. So when we have a video that's a certain size, and it's usually something along the order of, uh, uh, let's see, I think it's 1280 by 720 pixels, for example, then suddenly that video is considered HD, and more specifically 720p. So as you get video that's even larger than that, you have higher rated HD or higher rated high definition, which compares to traditional TV, which might be much smaller, something along the order of 500 pixels by uh, something like 400 pixels or, or 600 by 400, something along those lines. So what you're paying for whenever you buy some HD related object is you're basically just paying for more pixels uh, that you see at a time. How many of you in fact are ready for this DTV switchover next month? Or know what it is? <laughs> How, how many of you are not ready for the digital TV turnover, either because you haven't gotten around to it or because you're not, still not quite sure what's going on, if you want to fess up to that? OK, <laughs> excellent. So uh, do you have cable or satellite or just bunny ear antennas or some kind of other antenna? Cable, but I'm also thinking about giving up the Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, either way, if you have cable TV, uh, it's not a problem because the cable company will deal with all of this and you can keep using your same TV, your same hardware. Not a problem at all. Same goes for satellite. And yourself, do you have uh, antennas or cable or satellite TV? Mm, yep. No, no, you, you, no, we know you have cable. <laughs> Oh, so you do. So you two are set. So you can just ignore everything that's going on out there because everything will work just fine as well. Okay. In the cinemas. Okay. Are you aware of that? So I am not. And, and let, me, let me tweak lest we be remiss. So high definition, not high density, well, high but sure. Definition. But we're, we're quibbling. High definition. So you're saying the, the symphony, it's the, the orchestra. High transmission from the Met okay. into the cinema movie I, theater. I think I've heard about this. Some movie theaters are, you basically sit in a movie theater as if you're going to watch a movie, but instead of watching a movie, it's like a live broadcast from. Oh, TV. Yeah, it's, it's essentially a very large oh, screen TV that's in HD. Uh, that is uh, from the Met in Showcraft K3 there, for instance, or mm. in uh, Brookline, there's the uh, Coolidge Theatre. Oh, okay. Cinema. Right, Coolidge Theatre. You can get the European operas. Interesting, oh, really? I have not heard this. Yeah, I, I only, I've only heard about this. I haven't actually attended any of, these, any of these showings, but it certainly seems like an interesting alternative to actually going to one of these operas in the Met or, or overseas. You can go to a, a local theater that supports this sort of program, and you can watch live this opera. I, I believe it's live, this opera, uh, and it's, it's basically transmitted in, in HD or better than HD uh, uh, resolution to this theater, which is pretty interesting, yes. Yes. But are you going to do either? Oh, no, I'm not going to do either. <laughs> <laughs> but a good, good, uh, good tie-in, nonetheless. We did so, have one question, sorry. Oh, yes. yep. Um, can it get better than HD? Yes, uh, so beyond HD, there, there, so I believe the highest rated HD right now is, is 1080p, which is an image size of 1920 by 1080. Uh, and there are uh, resolutions that are higher than that used usually for movies, and I think... Uh, I'm not too familiar with, with this realm, but I believe it's called 2K and 4K. 
uh, which brings image sizes up to double that, so something like uh, uh, 2048 and then up to 4096 and some, some various other things, which are much, much higher. And you would not see this in, in consumer televisions or, um, or even your own tape recorder, for example, or your, cam your own camcorder for a while. But uh, movies, I believe, are recorded in these, in these higher resolutions. And, and I would suspect that the same sort of technology that's used to transmit the operas would most likely be in a, in a higher resolution, just because uh, movie theaters have so much screen to fill, so many pixels to fill, that they would try to use the, the higher resolution. And IMAX must be, no? IMAX is definitely higher resolution yeah. as well. I don't, I don't know specifics, but um, when, when it, before it was digital, uh, movie theaters had 35 millimeter film, which is uh, you know, very traditional uh, film. Your still camera would, would have it, for example. And IMAX had something many, many times larger so that there was much more film to cover. So that means that you would get much more detail. And the same sort of, uh, the same sort of thing applies to the digital area as well. But I think... IMAX might still be film just because there's so much. I think so, yeah. If you've been to the Museum of Science, they have those. Wait, is it the. No, that's the Omni Theater there. But at the. Right. But it, same the idea aquarium. for the most part. They, those huge reels of film that I think they put behind the glass as you're waiting there online to get into the theater. It's actually rather remarkable. <laughs> so, two little teasers before we move, take our break and then move on to peanut butter jelly time. Um, things are still a little unclear, but our. Our intention here is by the end of the lecture, everything will be clear. Um, how's that? Uh, security. So we talked at this point in the course about who cares about all of these little details. What are the actual implications to actually using a computer to either your, the privacy or the security of your actual data? And we talked about, say, things like spyware. Right, and viruses and worms. And what was one takeaway there? What can you do to protect yourself against what are apparently fairly omnipresent threats? Antivirus software. Yeah, so antivirus software. Most of you probably have something like McAfee or Norton. And we, we put forth the, the argument that you don't necessarily need to pay for this stuff. There are some free alternatives out there um, that are perhaps less annoying than the incessant prompting of a lot of these programs. Because one of the pr underlying problems of a lot of this software is that they're very high in what you'd call false positives. They think something's wrong when really it's just some behavior that the program wasn't designed to actually recognize as being OK. So here, too, there's this trade-off. And it will be this trade-off for years, probably, whereby the more restrictive you are, the more you annoy the user or confuse the user, but in theory, the safer the user actually is. This is why Vista, for instance, can get so frustrating sometimes because the default case for most behaviors is to say, Ooh, do you really want to do this? Do you really want to do this? And there comes a point where even myself it just starts hitting yes, yes, OK, and you don't even read what the message is. So there's some interesting sociological implications there. We move from security, which is hopefully all the more familiar to, to website development. And hopefully that's where you've been dabbling the past couple of weeks on final projects. And we introduced XHTML and a little bit of cascading style sheets. And to be sure, this was not a course about website design, nor was it a course about programming. But hopefully you got a taste of how people do these things. And given that there are tools out there, whether it's Dreamweaver or other such programs, there are, it's not actually that hard to make things that are nice, that are, that are clean, and that are actually live there out on the internet. And Dan, did you want to supplement something here before? Um, no, I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> So, intriguing as my pitch was, why don't we go ahead and take our five minute break and when we come back it will indeed be peanut butter jelly time. It is not, in fact, peanut butter jelly time just yet. Dan. So, I actually thought it would be helpful to take a minute because I know that there's, there seems to be a lot of confusion surrounding the uh, digital TV transition and so on, on one of the uh, one of the websites that I tend to frequent called uh, Consumerist, and it's consumerist.com, um, it, they had a couple of months ago basically just a flow chart for, to see what you are supposed to do for the digital TV transition. And so one thing that's really important to note is that DTV, digital TV, is not, does not imply HD TV or high definition TV. So if you have a regular TV, doesn't matter you still must follow this flow chart just to make sure. And, and also, the other thing is that is, uh, the, D, the DTV transition doesn't mean that you have to buy an HDTV. So unless you've already done that, don't worry about doing it. So this is the flow chart. Do you have a television? If you don't, then do nothing. If you do, 
you have to answer the question, do you use an antenna to watch television? And so this means not cable, not satellites. If you use bunny ears to watch television, then you go on to the next section. So if you, if you do use cable or, or satellite, then you do nothing, basically. Uh, if you use an antenna, you see if your TV has a digital tuner. And uh, if you, you'll know, you, or you should know, because most TVs will advertise this uh, on the box or even on the TV itself. And my TV, for example, has a very unnecessarily large DTV text right next to the logo. So I know that, that it has digital TV. If it does not have a digital tuner and you're using an antenna to watch TV, then you have to buy this digital transition box that everybody's talking about. And they have uh, coupons. I think the government has sponsored some coupons, but unfortunately, I think they ran out of money and I think they're supposed to be delaying it. There's a whole, it's just a big, big mess. But basically, uh, if you have very old TV, you're using bunny ears to watch TV, then you will need a tuner to be able to watch TV or what they call converter boxes. Otherwise, you don't have to do a thing. If you're just watching cable television, if you're just watching satellite television, don't worry about it, you are covered. But, but, but. But, 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 nope, there really is nothing that you have to do. <laughs> do nothing. So remember, just again, uh, uh, DTV doesn't necessarily imply HDTV, though HDTV does require digital television or DTV. So digital television comes in two formats, your regular standard television like, as, uh, like many of us have, and of course the higher definition or HDTV. That's why, it's part of the reason why we are transitioning. Any questions about that? Okay, back to you. All right, now it is peanut butter jelly time. So we thought that, if you're looking a little skeptical, this will soon be fun. Uh, as we like to do with some of our demonstrations, get at least a couple of folks involved. And what we thought we would do is pluck off some of our favorite problem sets for which you and students past submitted some how to uh, implement a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Now the submissions varied this year as always from the shortest of answers to the ridiculously most detailed answers. And we typically try to pick on some of the shorter ones since they are typically fraught with problems. Uh, previous to class uh, we, we took a couple of volunteers, one of whom was John Selig, unbeknownst to him, and another of whom was Dan Armendariz, and then the third, of course, is to be one of you. We need one brave volunteer to come on up here and stand beside, yes, come on up, John and Dan. So what we have here, and I think this is John's first experience with this, are some representative programs. So this is take one of peanut butter, how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, all of which hopefully started with the phrase, locate jars of peanut butter and jelly, a loaf of bread and a knife, all of which we just so happen to have right here. We don't have the best of tables, so we're going to do this on top of these two beautiful flat screen TVs over here. Um, so hopefully it won't be too much of a mess. But what we thought we'd do is, one, involve these guys in an execution of these programs and see just how correct they were, and then, two, involve all of you and see if we can, at the climax of this course, much like we changed a baby a few weeks ago, make the simplest of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. So with that said, if each of our volunteers could begin by facing the their table. Uh, I'll go ahead and call out the instructions, the first of which is locate jars of peanut butter and jelly, a loaf of bread, and a knife, all of which is hopefully somewhere before them. Now mind you, our volunteers should only do what I or what this student has said. You should make few or no assumptions because after all, you are now simply computers executing a computer program. Step two, if customer orders a special sandwich, if only jelly requested then, so I think we're going to have to answer a question here. Has the customer requested a special sandwich? No. I heard no first, so we're going to go with no and branch on the other condition, with, which is if else, if customer orders a regular sandwich, here we go. Dip knife in peanut butter. <laughs> Dip knife into peanut butter and spread across bread. Okay. Don't look at these guys. Just execute the program. And spread across bread. Then <laughs> dip knife into jelly. Braver uh, uh, computers would be thrusting harder. 
It's pretty tough. Oh, there we go. Wow. I could have regretted that. <laughs> dip knife into peanut butter. Uh, dip knife into jelly and spread across bread. I don't think we're getting a sandwich out of this one. Excellent. <laughs> then add another piece of bread and give to server. Ugh, that's not happening. <laughs> all right, so perhaps we should just b bort this one all together, much like we would have the, uh, the grading of this particular one. And let's move on to take two. So take two in this case was one of those ridiculously <laughs> long versions. So rather than work our way through this, which is clearly an instance of perfection, shall we say, why don't we move on to this one as our take two, uh, which is a little uh, more confined to the screen. So version two here. Locate jars of peanut butter and jelly, a loaf of bread, and a knife. Then open bag of bread. Already, it's an improvement. <laughs> <laughs> Open bag of bread and remove two slices. Then remove lid from, mind you, this is their indentation, not ours. <laughs> so then remove lid from peanut butter jar. Step forward. Remove lid from peanut butter jar. Remove lid from peanut butter jar and jelly jar. Then, if peanut butter or jelly are empty, then get a new jar. It's a good handling of that error condition. Else, <laughs> else give up. Um, so else give up. So moving on, step seven, we'll just assume that we haven't given up entirely. Step seven, using knife, spread peanut butter on one slice of bread. All right, progress. Sort of. <laughs> using knife, spread peanut butter on one slice of bread. Then, mind you, we'll be having peanut butter and jelly sandwiches at the end of class today. Then using knife, spread jelly on top of peanut butter. I don't want to do this <laughs> on top of these DVs. OK. And this is where things go bad. <laughs> Pl then place second slice of bread on top of first. <laughs> Dan will enjoy the climax here. <laughs> then eat. Oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so yeah. let's abort that one. Let's take Error. one last take, but this time we'll involve you, the audience. It's one thing to make fun of these submissions. Let's see if we can improve upon them. So step one for everyone, one last time here. Locate jars of peanut butter and jelly, a loaf of bread, and a knife as best you can at this point. And now step two from the audience. First to call it out. What do you want them to do? Give me something. Re remove two pieces of bread from the opening of the bag and place them on the table. Flat side down. Flat side down. <laughs> <laughs> That's good though. That's good. Next step. Grasp the knife. Careful. Oh. Grasp the knife on the handle end. Oh. Yeah, you're dedicated. <laughs> yeah? What's next? Use other hand to open jar. Be more precise. It's jelly jar. Jelly jar. Got lucky on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Next step. Remove lid from peanut butter. Next step. Control C. <laughs> Next step. Oh, good. I'm going to go here. Remove paper from top of jar. Peel. Sorry, peel. Peel. Delicately. <laughs> Might be a good time to throw in an if. If there's less than, say, a tablespoon of peanut butter, 
if there's less than a tablespoon of peanut butter, then replenish the jar. Then replenish the jar. We seem to be okay, but good, good error handling. Next step. <laughs> Next step. Carefully insert knife into jelly jar and carefully extract. You're making an assumption, each of you. I don't know what carefully means. I'm a carefully. <laughs> 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 Next step. Carefully insert knife into jelly jar and carefully extract a small amount of onto knife. Spread. Spread. Gently. Gently. <laughs> I think we're being a little laconic here. What's next? Spread what? Spread the knife. Spread the knife that has the jelly on it. I don't think that's right. <laughs> Next. <laughs> We're going to lose the audience here if we don't finish this up. Next. Okay, hold the knife and, uh, uh, okay, yeah, hold that, <laughs> I'm not good with long sentences. Hold the jelly jar and spread the, and okay. Do this. Do this. I think he was right. That was a pretty good. Okay, good. Right. Progress. Okay. Next. Someone from the middle. Middle is kind of copping out here. <laughs> what do you got? Staring at the floor does not exempt you from the exercise. <laughs> Insert knife into peanut butter jar and <laughs> through top of peanut butter jar <laughs> and bring us home, someone. It's getting awkward. <laughs> Scoop out approximately a tablespoon of peanut butter. Did not define tablespoon. With knife, shall we add? I thought they wanted us to like carve a tablespoon out of peanut butter. <laughs> And next. <laughs> it's really unpleasant. <laughs> okay, spread peanut butter evenly over surface of bread. Without, with, hmm, sorry? The other slice of bread, John. <laughs> We're going to have a lot of extra footage tonight. Next step. <laughs> I feel like we have room for one or two more steps before we get canceled. Nice. <laughs> Second to last step. I'm Place two pieces together <laughs> and the last step shall be eat. <laughs> No. Okay, that was another disaster, but thank you, perhaps, a round of applause for our volunteers here. All right, so you, we began this course, we began this course with a promise that you would be hit with a whole lot of information. This, in fact, is on page two of the syllabus, this hack from MIT, in which we promised that you would be hit, uh, many of you, most of you, all of you, with way more information, perhaps, than you could swallow over the course of the semester. And the, the metaphor here was that much like this hack promised that getting an education from MIT is like drinking from a water fountain, uh, perhaps for many of you, this course has felt much the same, especially when you get hit with new acronyms and with new topics and week after week, new topics. But hopefully, as we said earlier tonight, at least one takeaway will be even if you haven't retained all of this information, you at least now have a better sense of where you can go dig up more information, where you can go and find out what something means, and even barring that so that you're at least a little more comfortable with the fact that you might not know each and every one of these technical details. So the grand finale here tonight besides enjoying some peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, shall be to reveal Fall 2008's mouse pad. A number of you voted over the past week. Uh, we have gone to press with one of these designs, which will be mailed out to those of you who opted in with your address. Uh, so we thought in these final moments we would go ahead and reveal the winner of Fall 2008's mouse pad, which will be forever immortalized on desks. And the winner is... I hope you enjoy that. That took a lot a while in Photoshop, actually. Okay, and the winner is 
Congratulations. You have all survived computer science, Elon. Dan's got nothing, so let's I call it a night. We'll stick around if you have any questions. Big thanks to Chris and John as well for a wonderful semester, and it's really been a pleasure having you all here week after week. So thank you thank all. You. Bye. Yay. <laughs> I don't think this is in my contract. <laughs>